friends, please be with me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your eyes, O oh God, for you are our rock. You are our redeemer. Amen. So have you ever been out at like a cafe or on the train or on the bus or something? and you are minding your own business, and then you come into someone else's conversation halfway through. Like you're listening to music, you take out your headphones, and you realize someone next to you is in the middle of something, and you don't know where it started, and you don't know where it's going, but all you know is you can't make heads or tails of it. This is what's happening in the reading for today. So, Josiah, thank you so much for that reading. That was, I was like, yep, that's pretty good. Also, could I see the piece of paper? Because my printer broke right while I was preparing for church. Thank you so much. This is perfect. So, we drop down kerplunk in the middle of 1 Corinthians, and we're in the idol meat section, whatever that is. So, let me start with just a little bit of background, because I think it's really helpful to talk about what is going on here. Why are we talking about meat sacrifice to idols? Why, what does this have to do with love and knowledge and any of this? How does this all come together? So, this letter is 1 Corinthians. It is the first letter in the Bible that we have from Paul to the people of Corinth. But it isn't the first piece of correspondence between them. Paul was evangelizing Corinth for about a year and a half before he went on to extend his evangelism tour throughout the Aegean Sea. He writes this letter from Ephesus back to Corinth after they've written him a letter asking for help. He helped set them up, and now they're asking for advice. So we're here in chapter 8 going through one item in the laundry list that Paul is bringing to them. If you open up your Bible, some of them will have like headers that go through sections, and it's like on idol meat, on sexuality, on the Lord's Supper, on getting the court involved. There's all these different things where you can tell that Paul is just working his way like through the letter. Like, okay, here's this. You had a question about this? Here we go. You had a question about this? Here we go. And that's where we come to the idol meets. Now, the people of Corinth in the Corinthian church were very similar to the, all of Corinth itself. It's an incredibly mixed community. Corinth was the capital of the province that made up the southern part of Greece during the Roman Empire. So this is a powerful area. This is an area of transit. It's right on this little isthmus between the Aegean and the Adriatic Sea. So we have a lot of people coming and going. We have in 1 Corinthians that wonderful line, in Christ there is no Greek nor Jew, nor slave nor free, no man, no woman. That's very important in Corinth because there are all those people in this early church and more so. There are people from Egypt. There are people from all over Turkey. Everyone's in Corinth. And now they're all trying to make a community here in this Christian enclave. And there's problems showing up. Because as always happens, when different cultures get together, it's not always the easiest elision. Sometimes it's harder than others. And this is one of those places where we see some of the cultural context like just really butting heads in here. So let's get into the nitty gritty. We're here talking about meat sacrifice to idols. So what this is, is when there would be a sacrifice given at a pagan temple. So this might be to the emperor. There was definitely a temple to the emperor in Corinth as the capital, the imperial cult was big there. Uh, Isis and Serapis, the Egyptian god and goddess were huge also at this time. So we have all sorts of different religions and all these people come to the temples to sacrifice meat. So part of the meat would get burned for the god. Part of it would go as pay to those working at the temple, to the officials, to the priests, and part of it would go to the wealthy. And then they could either sell that at a profit or they could invite you to, your, to their house or to the temple and have a big feast. Those big feasts is what we're talking about here. What would it mean for an early Christian to go to a feast at a temple to eat the meat that had been dedicated to that God, to that idol? And that's the question that we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So what would it mean to give up meat? 
Why don't you just not do it? Why isn't that the easiest question? Why are they bringing this question to Paul? You think they could solve it on themselves? Well, the meat, eating meat in the temple demonstrated a huge social standing. It's going to eat meat in the temple is sort of the who's who, right? This is the where you see who are the major players in Corinth. So they're asking people to give up a lot of their social wealth in not doing this. They're also trying to buy, how do we get social unity here? They're asking Paul a legalistic question. And in the interest of the unity of the early Christian church, he is transforming that legalistic question into an ethical one. It's not, how do we do this? So how do I eat meat? How do I make people like get down with this? How do I explain this to them? And instead of responding with, well, here's the parameters. This is when you can eat meat. This is when you can't eat meat. This is how you can do it. This is how you can't. Paul just says, I'm not gonna give you more laws. What I'm gonna do is tell you the ethics of what you should be doing to live in community. And this community is different than the Greek community. This is what Paul loves to do. He flips the script and he says, this isn't about who of you is the smartest. Because I get it. Those of you who think you're smart, you know you can't eat, eating the meat is fine and it doesn't actually mean anything, but that's not what's most important here. What's most important here is love. That's the flip that Paul does, is it's not about knowledge, it's about <coughs> love. And I think that is so pertinent to a church especially here in Boston, right? In this city, super academic city, where so much value comes by what letters come after your name, what degrees you've gotten. Paul says, God actually doesn't care about any of that. Like it's good, God's happy for you, but that's not where your value as a Christian comes from. It's not from who here's the smartest. It's from who here can love the hardest. That's what matters. And so think about what it is that you do in order to help support others. Things where it might not be a big deal for you, but you want to engage and change your actions to help build each other up in Christ. I think about the Eucharist, about communion, and what it means to have grape juice at communion. My guess is the Corinthians we're really hoping that he was going to say, some eat meat, some don't eat meat. I bet some churches are like, some drink wine, some drink grape juice. Easy enough. That's what we're going to do in order to be in solidarity with those in recovery. But to only have grape juice means we're not here to make decisions for you. We're not here to pass judgment. The purpose of the Lord's Supper, as Paul calls it, is to bring each other together, to build each other up in love. And that's the purpose of the grape juice, is we're not, here to, we're not here to judge, but to build each other up and enable all to be equal participants, fear of judgment or anxiety at this meal. This also shows up when you see like a ramp outside of the church. Some people can use stairs, easy, but everyone can use a ramp. Why wouldn't you do a ramp? It just makes it so much easier and so much more welcoming to everyone. This is about choosing to love those without privileges. And this is really true in both Corinth and I can see it all over Boston in terms of class. How do we build each other up? When we hear someone who talks different or talks uneducated, how do we build each other up with love? How do we support one another? one another here in the city or in this church community. And this really brings me back to the first three lines of this chapter. He goes on, right, he does all his explanatory work, but I feel like in these first three lines is really, this is, this is the moral of the story. He brings it up front. While knowledge puffs up, love builds up. That's how you're going to build the church, a stable structure. You may think you know something, but you still won't know it the way you ought to know it. But anyone who loves God is known completely by God. For Paul, for Corinth, for us today, the only knowledge that matters is God's knowledge of us. That is where true Christian unity happens, is God's full knowing of us in our love for one another and in our love for God. 
So I encourage you, if you are someone who has been called uneducated, stupid, not enough, not smart enough, not whatever enough, to look to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and see and hear that Paul, that the early Christian church had similar concerns and similar name callings. And Paul said, even if that is true, it doesn't matter because we are here to build a community on the strong foundation of love, not on the pup, puffed up, aesthetically pleasing, but sure to deflate over time, knowledge. Amen.